Hello and welcome to Ministry Online Training Center. My name is Jeff Jackson. I'm one of the teachers here. And before I get started, I would like to open up in prayer. Heavenly Father is a personal favor to me. I just ask that the Holy Spirit open the eyes of those that are going to be viewing this lesson so they can see your word, that you open their ears so they can hear your word, that you open their hearts so they can feel your word, and that you open their minds so they can understand your word. Holy Spirit, I ask that you look through my eyes, you speak through my mouth, and you touch through my heart the lesson that you want taught today, and that it brings forth a great harvest, but not I will, but not my will, but your will be done. Amen. Okay, the lesson that the Holy Spirit is going to be teaching on today is on discipleship. And the title of this lesson is, What is Discipleship? And my text scripture is going to be coming from 28, excuse me, Matthew 28, 19. But I'm going to start in verse 16. And in Matthew 28, 16, it says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, and to a mountain where Jesus had appointed them, Verse 17, and when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And verse 18, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me, in heaven and in earth. Verse 19, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. What is discipleship and what is Jesus calling us to do in Matthew 28, 18 through 20? Is this a command or a suggestion? Does it mean we are just, just to evangelize and let people find their faith on their own? Or does this mean we are to lead others and teach the precepts of the scriptures and the character of our Lord? Does it require obedience and action on our part? Or are we disciples just by being a Christian and being in the church on Sundays? This passage at the end of Matthew's Gospel is, is what is called the Great Commission. It is also the great failure of the church. This is the main call to the church from the Lord and Savior and is the one thing most churches do not do at all. This is the main reason for the church to exist. Yet, can you name one church that actually teaches peach people the basis of the faith and then moves them into deeper into the precepts of his love and his word through all the seasons of their life? If discipleship is mostly absence from the churches, then most Christians, Christians will not understand how to live out their faith. They will not be able to handle problems, witness share their faith, or grow effectively spiritually because no one is modeling or showing them the way. Some churches do a great job with evangelism, but once the people come in, they are stored in the pews. Where is the discipleship? What is it? Is it the back door of the church as big as the front door? Being a disciple encompasses more than just asking Christ in and goes far beyond baptism. Our conversion, our acceptance of Christ as Savior, our election is the beginning, the entrance into the faith and the Christian life. It is not only the act of being a Christian, it would be like joining a club but never venturing into the club. Baptism is the initiation and public dedication. It is to be the door through which we go in our walk of faith, as it is also our profession and testimony of our faith publicly. It does not stop there. It starts there. So what does the average church do about discipleship? In most churches, people are encouraged to accept Christ or make a profession of faith. Then they are congratulated, put on the membership roll, and then quickly forgotten. Sadly, the church has forsaken discipleship and has left, it, left its members to figure out these spiritual growths on their own. In doing so, it causes many to give up on Christianity, while others become confused, callous, or complacent or they are swept away by false doctrine and cults because they do not know the difference. 
The church is called to make disciples. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I will, am always with you to the very end of the age. And again, that's from Matthew 28, 18 through 20. This is perhaps the chief characteristic that most, ch most churches somehow forget. It is also the quintessential aspect and reason the church exists. So why is it that so few churches actually have disciples making as a primary ministry? For most churches, it is something they think that already is being done when in fact it is not being done. Saying that going to church on Sundays is discipleship or providing a couple of token adult Sunday school classes that few attend is not discipleship. Some churches throw in an afterthought or maybe offer a class or something related to the subject. Due to our human fallen thinking, we desire the right to ourselves more than we desire the life that Christ has for us. Let me say that again. Due to our human fallen thinking, we desire the right to ourselves more than we desire the life that Christ has for us. It is difficult for the non-Christian to accept a savior when they think that they have to give up their rights. It is similarly difficult for the Christian to live a life that is truly surrendered and poured out to the sovereignty of God. Yet true discipleship cannot begin until we learn one key important aspect of life. There is one God and you are not him. We must learn to yield to the Lordship of our God and not to desire our own will. When we do this, the discipleship process can begin. However, when we refuse, we will be the strife and conflict that gives Christianity a black eye. We become the problem rather than the solution. Therefore, discipleship as a priority gets lost. We make up excuses saying, well, people will not come. We are Christians already, so why do we need to be disciples? The Spirit will guide them. This is not what Jesus was saying. He is saying for us to evangelize. He is saying for us to evangelize only. We do not have anybody to lead us. Excuses, excuses, excuses. And no response to Christ. What they do not realize is that we are not responsible for people coming. We are only responsible for obeying our Lord and doing it. The reason there is no one to lead is that there is an extreme lack of real disciples in the church. That is, people who live, who lives are surrendered to Christ and out of gratitude to Him are modeling and teaching biblical precepts to others. Even the Apostle Paul spent three years being discipled by Barnabas and he received his call and was empowered directly from Christ himself. Humbleness is characterized by the willingness to grow in Christ and receive learning and experience growth. Peter tells us we ought to be humble toward one another so that we can know the grace of God and not be in opposition to God. Then secondly he says we had better be humble not only toward one another, but toward God. This is so straightforward. This is so essential to be a blessed church, to be a growing church, not in members, but in discipleship. Check out some personal reading that will help discipleship and mentoring are not an option, but a command. Matthew 18, 16 through 20. These are just some um, scriptures that you could read on your own. Uh, Romans 12, the a uh, complete chapter and 1 Corinthians 12 the complete chapter also you can read Galatians 6 1 through 10 and Mark 135 through chapter 2 12 we must follow out our obedience and mentor in our multi-generational lifestyle caring for the total person this will move us from playing church to really being a church an example is um, a new Christian, he's just been saved, 
and a new baby that's just come into the world. In the natural, when a new baby comes into the world, it's the parent's responsibility to take care of all that baby's needs and wants, well, mostly all their needs, until they are able to do it for themselves. And for some children, it may be when they're 18, when they're 21, when they're 25, when they're 35, <laughs> when they're 45, and on. The truth of the matter is your responsibility to take care of the child to, to teach them so that they could be able to do it on their own. And that's the work of a, a discipling, to teach the disciple, to be able to teach another disciple, to be able to teach another disciple, and so on and so forth. And one thing you want to be able to do is to teach him everything. For instance, if I'm not tithing, me teaching someone to tithe is going to be a hard subject because this is something that I'm not doing myself. You want to be open, not only to your students, but open to the Holy Spirit. And let the Holy Spirit guide you. And those that are being discipled, you want to follow the one that's doing the discipling as long as he is following Christ. And what you want to do, you want to be in the Word yourself so that you know when the ones that's doing the discipling is not following God's Word. Amen? This will move us from just playing church to really being a church. The effective church is mentoring, building relationships, and teaching each other members and caring people who will be discipled themselves, who are being taught, encouraged, and led. The death of a church happens when we follow political trends not the national politics, but the patriotic personalities that want to control people. In addition, when we have a controlling attitude, we do not allow God to control us. Thus, we become empty shells and hollow logs. Being hollow means there is nothing working within us. There is no creator of the universe leading and directing our ways, so we become worthless to the kingdom of God. Making disciples takes visions and understanding of the scriptures. It gives the church a purpose to form leaders who grow other leaders in an outgrowth of their growth. The Christians, especially the leaders who disciple and equip others, is a person who is living the faith for themselves and setting goals for their personal growth before they set goals for others. Their skills and abilities are growing them to be a better worker because first, they are striving to be a better child of God. From the character of Christ will come the conduct of Christ. If we choose to follow him, then those values of our daily walk which drive our behavior will in turn influence others. We cannot lead where we have not been. So where you do not know the direction to go or where you know or where you do not know the direction to go. This is why discipleship is so essential to the aspect of being a Christian. We are called not to just visualize discipleship, but to do it. Not just to talk about it, but to do it. One cannot just think about dinner and satisfy hunger. The meal has to be prepared and then eaten. The effective church will take scripture and the call of our Lord seriously and then implement it into a functionality. Jesus' purpose for his three years of earthly ministry was the discipleship and equipping of his 12 disciples. This was his drive and where most of his time was spent. He was focused on the teaching of the kingdom of God, teaching men to see beyond their present situations to the life to come. With his teaching, Jesus entrusted his church and the people to care of the people he taught. They were to reciprocate themselves to others. The objective was that every believer was an equipper, every member a minister, every Christian involved in the life and gifts of the body to influence the world. The word must touch who we are and transform the very core of our being. This is the knowledge that leads and transforms. One cannot lead where he does not know the way. And to know the way, you must have knowledge. Knowledge comes from experience. 
and experience comes from discipleship. The will of God is for us to study his word, which will change our behavior. A Christian and especially a leader in the church must have the knowledge and experience to put into practice the work that needs to be done. The disciple will be studious so that the word nourishes him. He must study and apply the scriptures, not just read it occasionally like a novel. The word must touch who we are and transform the very core of our being. This is the knowledge that leads and transforms. So what are we to do? God does not ask us to seek converts. He simply asks us to do discipleship. Discipleship is modeling and teaching Christians the precepts of the Bible, mainly prayer, doctrine, Christian living, and worship. Yes, we are still to evangelize, but this is not our main mission and call. When we evangelize, we must realize that this is the role of the Holy Spirit to bring people into an intimate relationship with God. This is an act of divine intervention and grace. He uses us as the tools, but he is the means. We are to care and share with others his love and his character. We obey and reach, but we cannot lead people anywhere. He is the one who leads. This leads us to our role, which is, which is to model to the convert Christ-like character, encouraging others to surrender themselves to Jesus Christ. Let's look at Galatians 2, 20 and 21. And in verse 20 it says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. However, this is only the beginning. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. Surrender is the process in which we grow toward him and his will and away from our will. Surrender is making Christ Lord of our life. We have to get rid of our perceptions, reckless ideals, faulty thinking, and other such things that are barriers to our growth so we can make room for him. Jesus authors our faith and teaches us how to run the race according to God's will, his glory, his worship, and his pur purpose. Thus we gain a deeper intimacy with our Lord as our commander and friend, as our God and our King, as our love and our reason for being. In his purpose, we will find contentment, joy, and fulfillment. There are three main reasons for principles in discipleship. Number one is relationship and mentoring. Number two is teaching. And number three is service. Now in relationships, we are called to build a net network of relationships so we can build one another up in the faith through friendship and mentoring. Like Jesus said, he would make us fishers of men. Most people are intimidated by discipleship out of ignorance, fear, unawareness, or just not wanting to be bothered out of their comfort zone. The term discipleship has been viewed as something only for the spiritual mature or just for certain people, such as Sunday school teachers and Bible study leaders. What we need to see is Barnabas and Paul, and later Paul and Timothy, where the elder, more experienced Christians take the inexperienced Christians under his wings and help him to become a better, deeper, more effective Christian. Keep in mind that Paul was highly educated and experienced leader, and although Barnabas may have not been educated formally as Paul was, or at Paul's level in the world, Barnabas was Paul's superior in the experience and knowledge of the word. Friendship, knowledge, experience combine into mentoring and the quality 
of the relationship are the keys for this spiritual growth to have happened. Discipleship equals friendship with a Christ-centered focus. However, it is very important that we make disciples in his image, not ours. Next is teaching. The main principle in discipleship is teaching. We are called as a church to teach one another. Not only the kids in Sunday school, but also all Christians at all ages and all levels. How to live the Christian life. The new Christian and all Christians for that matter need sound instructions on how to live the Christian life. We do not learn by magic or osmosis. Although the Spirit will lead, it is still our responsibility to learn and grow and to teach others. In most churches, there are some opportunities to be in Bible studies and even teach. The focus must be to teach the basics first, how to study the Bible, how to pray, how to worship, essential doctrine, etc. And as we grow, how to be a Christian family, how to find God's will, our conduct in the workplace, discovering our spiritual gifts, leadership, and so forth. Then the deeper expression into the faith can be explored along with the accountability and so forth. Next is service. We are called to put our faith into practice. We now take the relationship, mentoring, and learning and carry it out in our daily life. This is often expressed in service projects and missions, but this is only a small, although necessary aspect of service. Service is how we live our lives and model his character on a daily basis to those around us. When we are in ministry, we need to realize it is not what I do, but whom I can equip. As we practice by reciprocating what we have learned to others, we will also be built up. In other words, the more you teach, the more the Holy Spirit is going to give you to teach. Amen? All three of these principles collate and build into each other synergistically. The doctrine that the human will and the Holy Spirit will work together to bring about spiritual regeneration or salvation. Discipleship can be screwed and people fall away if any of these three principles are let go. We will lose valuable opportunities to share and teach one another if, as Jesus stands at the door and knocks, we are watching TV and ignoring his door. Let me say that again. We will lose valuable opportunities to share and teach one another if, as Jesus stands at the door and knocks, we are watching TV and ignoring, his, and ignoring the door. Remember, the focus is never the task in and of itself. Rather, it is the glory and worship of our Lord and the enabling of one another to do and be better at the Christian life. What we learn and do here during our short time on earth will echo throughout the vastness of eternity. Just as anyone can be a friend, anyone in Christ can disciple. Let me say that again. Just as anyone can be a friend, anyone in Christ can disciple. Remember, the great commission to go out and make disciples was not just given to the pastors or the ministers or those that go to Bible studies or those that go to church. That great commission was given to the entire body of Christ. Amen? We cannot expect only a select few to take up this call and imperative, and we do not need to be spiritual giants to do the work. We just need to be real in Christ, be willing to learn and grow as one of his disciples, and replicate our knowledge to others. Many people feel anxious when it comes to reaching out, and it requires a big step of faith that many do not want to make. Therefore, the excuses pile on top of Therefore, the excuses pile on top and over our responsibilities. That is a flaw in our human nature, our sinful nature. If we, are just, if we all just sit in the pew and expect someone else to reach out to others, we will be a disobedient to our Lord. When no one reaches out, we are condemning others to feel and be lonely and isolated. We must reach out as a team effort, linking people that are quiet, that have quiet personalities, who are reserved at interacting with others, with people who are more extroverted and do not have this problem. What is a disciple? 
a disciple one who models and teaches Christians the precepts of the Bible, prayer, doctrine, relationship, Christian living, service, and worship, to name the main ones. Question. Ask yourself, how do I and how can I do these? Have made a profession, acceptance of faith in who Christ is and what he did on our behalf. Let's look at a couple of scriptures to, uh, to coincide with that statement. In 1 John 3, 23, that's 1 John 3, 23, it says, And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of the Son, on his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Acts 16, 30 and 31 reads, And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. In other words, if you try to do this on your own, yes, it will be a big task. But if you submit to the Holy Spirit, let the Holy Spirit lead and guide you, then all you're doing is following what the Holy Spirit is leading and guiding you to do. And the Holy Spirit is never going to lead you and guide you in a wrong area when it comes to uh, showing somewhere, someone the way to be just like Jesus. Because what we are doing, we want to show who we're discipling to be like Jesus so they can show someone else to be like Jesus and so on and so on. Amen. Jesus is Lord of all. And we see this in 1 Corinthians 3, 2 and Romans 8, 9 through 17. In Romans, excuse me, in 1 Corinthians 3, 2, it says, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For here, too, ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. In other words, right now you may not be able, but the more time you spend in God's word and the more time you let the Holy Spirit lead you and guide you, you will be able. You remember when Jesus sent the 70 out, a lot of them wasn't ready. But Jesus gave them a commandment to go out and to make disciples and to, uh, to teach them the things that he had taught them. And as a leader, one of your jobs is going to be to know when your students are ready. And you want to be able to, to uh, it's, it's like a mother bird and a baby bird. A mother bird knows when the baby bird is ready to go out the nest. One way they know, they push them out the nest. <laughs> and we as leaders, you know, sometimes we're going to have to push our disciples into areas that we know that they're ready to go and, and be able to, to help them when they need help and also to push them out of that nest when we know it's time for them to get out that nest. And in Romans 8, 19 through 17, it says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And in verse 10 it says, And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by the spirit that dwelleth in you. Verse 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. For the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Verse 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also glorify together. Look at verse 17. It says that we are joint heirs with Christ. In other words, you're not going to be out there on your own. Remember in Matthew 28, 
18 or 19, it says that all power is given unto me. Jesus lets us know that all power is given unto him. So then when we go out to make disciples, we know that we have that power that was given unto him. And he's letting us know that he has this power and he can give it to whoever he wills to give it to. And guess what? If you're going or if you're called to make disciples, he has given you that power. A disciple is willing to grow in Christ. And we see that in 2 Peter 1, 5 through 7. And in verse 5 it says, And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to your virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. Discipleship is not an option, it's a command. A disciple has surrendered himself to his Lord. And we see that in Romans 8, 28 through 32. In verse 28 it says, And we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Verse 30. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? In verse 32, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us? all things. So if he's given us all things, guess what? He's giving you the ability to become a disciple and to uh, make a disciple. Amen? And in 1 Peter 4, 2 it says, that he no longer should live the rest of this time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. In other words, God did not get you saved or lead you to be saved so that you could just sit on the sideline and just receive. No, God wanted you to say so that you become the image of his son, Jesus Christ. And not only that, he wants you to go out and lead others into the Lord so they can become in the image of Jesus Christ. And remember, salvation is not just receiving the Lord. Salvation is learning to be just like Jesus. And it's a process. Like I say, a lot of the church, they get you saved, they sit you in the pew, and you're pretty much on your own from there. But what God wants us to do, he wants us to get them saved and to make them disciples. And disciple, it takes time. And it takes some effort on your part. In other words, it's a commitment. Jesus told those that were following him, he, there was a, a great crowd following him, and he stopped and he turned around. He said, if you want to be my disciple, you have to learn the cost. And the cost is pretty much giving up everything. And a lot of people think that once you give up something for the Lord, that it's gone or it's done with. No. Anything that, the, that you give up to the Lord, the Lord is going to turn around and bless you with it again, or bless you more than what you had in the beginning. Amen? Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before a day, that we should walk in them. And in Titus 2.2 2 it reads, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. If you're going to be discipling, the first thing you want to find is a committed or faithful person. And you say, how can I find a faithful or committed person? You could just look at them, just observe them. Are they committed to come to church? Are they committed to what their tithes and offerings? Are they committed, you know, when calls has come that uh, the pastor is asking for help of volunteers? You could just look at those things right there and you can see if that person is committed to the church. And if that's the person that's committed to the church, that's one that you want to approach as far as being a disciple. A disciple makes good decisions and is focused on God's will. A disciple is honest with God and with others. A disciple walks in the precepts, and with his precepts, or in other words, in God's word. A disciple knows his ability, gifts, and talents. 
And in 1 Peter 4.10 it says, Every man hath received the gifts. Even so, minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And in 1 Peter 2.13-15 it says, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors, or unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evil doers, and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that we well doing, yet may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. A disciple is infused with humility. An example is in uh, Psalms 19, excuse me, 149.4. And it says, For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meat with salvation. And in Proverbs 3.34 it reads, Surely he scorned the scorners, but he giveth grace unto the lowly. And in Matthew 18.4 it reads, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of God. See, a lot of people think that humbling yourself is bowing down and letting other people have dominion over you. No, humbling yourself is showing, um, is showing strength. Because it's, it's like Jesus. Jesus humbled himself unto the cross. In other words, if Jesus didn't humble himself to the cross, guess what? He never would have died because a man could not kill God. So Jesus had to humble himself. And, and Jesus, he stated that no one takes my body or no one takes my life. He says, I give my life up. And that's what the Lord wants us to do as far as becoming a disciple or being disciple is to humble ourselves. Another example is found in Ephesians 4, 2, and 4, 3, talking about Jesus. It says, with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, enduring to keep the unity of the Holy Spirit in bond and in peace. And in Colossians 3, 12 through 14, it says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfectness. In other words, all the love, the joy, and the peace that God has bestowed on us, He wants us to share and show that to those that are being discipled. Verse uh, Philippians 2, 3, and 4 says, Let nothing be done with strife or vain glory, but in loneliness of mind let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. One way that you can grow in the, in the Lord is to stop being selfish and wanting your own things. Because remember, God has already given you everything. What you want to do as being... Uh, a discipler is letting those that you're discipling to stop being selfish and start sharing, start looking out for the love and the peace of others. Start, start esteeming others more than themselves. And a good way for uh, them to, to start or a good place for them to start is if they're married, stop trying to get your own way in a marriage and start looking to edify your spouse more than yourself. Amen. And in 1 Peter 5, 6, it says, Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Like I said other, earlier, uh, not humbling yourself under another man, but humbling yourself under God. In other words, one of the things that a disciple does is to make sure that God is before everything. Even though you are discipling others, guess what? You're still being discipled by the Lord Jesus. And it's not... Uh, a date kind of thing like uh, after three years you have learned it all after five years this is a lifetime thing of being disciple and discipling amen and James 14 it says humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up in other words if you think you're humbling yourself under another man or if the enemy is trying to put that on you just know that you're humbling yourself under the Lord amen 
And when you realize you're humbling yourself under the Lord, there's nothing that another person can do that can get you off track unless you allow them to do that. And in Romans 6.14 it says, For sin shall not have dominion over me, for you are not under the law, but you are under grace. And remember, under grace is receiving everything that the Lord has already given you. And it's not out of works. If it was works, it wouldn't be grace. It would be a wage. Amen. Ephesians 4.29-32 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and even speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, giving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. In other words, you don't want to try to tell your disciples to be kind to others, uh, to speak well of others, to uh, speak with salt, and uh, to always uh, have grace in your words. And you're hollering at them, or they see you hollering at your spouse or your children, are always in an uproar. Because remember, your disciple is going to be watching you. And you don't want to put bad qualities into your disciples. And a good way to avoid that is always receiving or following the steps of the Lord. Amen. A disciple is not greedy. Luke 12, 15 says, And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetedness. For man's life consists not in the abundance of things which he possesses. Romans 12, 14 and 15 says, Bless them which persecute you, bless and not curse. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. In other words, Paul says he has become to everyone whatever they need. In other words, they needed a minister, he became a minister. If they needed someone to listen to, he was a listener. If he needed someone to love them, he loved them, whatever. Those that were in need, needed, he became them. And you being a discipler, that is going to be one of your goals to be whatever your disciples need you to be. A disciple is willing to wait on God's timing. A discipler is a listener. A disciple confesses sins and repents from them. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. A disciple will not have a trace of pride in him. Job 35.12 says, There they cry, but none giveth answer, because of the pride of evil men. And in Proverbs 6.16-19, through 19, it says, These six things do the Lord hate. Yea, seven are abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaks lies, and he that sows discord among the brothers. Proverbs 16.5 says, Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand in hand, in, he shall not be unpunished. A disciple is discerning. First Peter 5 eight says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh around seeking whom he may destroy, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same affliction are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. It says that the enemy walks around as a roaring lion. And I watch a lot of um, animal shows. And one thing I learned about a predator is he's always looking for whom he may devour. In other words, he's looking for the old. He's looking for the weak. He's looking for the main. He's looking for those that are distracted. And he's looking for those that are not... Uh, that are straight away from the herd. And the enemy is the same way. He cannot devour you, not unless he, you give him access to you. In other words, those same things that I named that, um, that um, a, a predator is looking for, it's the same thing that the enemy is looking for. And one of the best ways 
to not be in their group is to stay in the group with the, with the church. In other words, when the animals are all together, it's very hard for the predator to try to take a prey because there's a group. And wherever uh, two or more is, guess what? The Lord is there too. Amen? And in James 4, 7, it says, Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. See, a lot of us take this scripture out of water. We try to resist the devil first and thinking he will flee. It says, no, submit yourself to God first. In other words, if you be a disciple, submit yourself to the ones that's discipling you. It's always an order with God. God always does everything in order and in, in decent fashion. Amen? A disciple loves people and the lost. Philippians 2, 7 says, But made himself of no reputation, but took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Jesus came down in the form of a man, said that we could become in the form of him. Amen? And in 2 Peter 3, 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but his long-suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In other words, God's will is for the world to be saved, not just those that are in the church. God's will is for those that don't have anything or want anything to do with him to be saved. But you know what? They're not going to know anything about God until you open up your mouth and go out there and share his word with those. And one of the best places for you to start or for you to get more comfortable with is starting your own household. Start sharing it with your family. Start sharing it with your children. Start sharing it with your neighbors. God calls us to motivate and teach others to move more in prayer and to care for others. And Matthew 5.47 it says, For if we love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? In other words, if you're going to demonstrate the love of God for others, you got to go and share this word for those who even the world doesn't love. You remember when Jesus came on the scene, most people thought he would hang with kings and royalty and all this, but no, he spent most of his time with the people that society didn't want anything to do with. And to show that God is not a respecter of people, and that not only did God love you when you're on the top, but he loves you when you're at the bottom. Amen? And in John 17, 20 through 23, it says, Neither I pray these alone, but for them for which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou givest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. That's one thing you want to con convey to everyone you come in contact with, especially those that are unsaved, is that Jesus loves them as much as God loves Jesus. Why? Because God wants to be the father of the entire world. Remember, Jesus paid the price for the, the sin of the entire world, which means that he paid the price for those that know the society or no one wants to be a part of. He paid the price for the drug addict, for the drug dealer, for the prostitute, for those that have uh, um, physical ailments. He paid the price for everything. And that's our message to the world and to our disciples is that God loves you based on who he is, not based on what you do. And in Ephesians 4, 1 and 2, it says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you are worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. And that vocation which you are called is to go out and make disciples. Verse 2 says, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. A disciple is willing to endure hardships and consider them as growth opportunities. See, a lot of us take hardships or, as something that, that's hard and we don't want to go through. But see, the Lord lets us know that some of those hardships that we're going to is so that he can get us on the other side or that he can get us built up on a better foundation besides the foundations that we were on before we went through a hardship. 
And in James 1, 2, it says, My brother, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. You may say, why would I want to call it all joys? Well, look at verse 3. It says, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have a perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. The reason that you want, that the Lord wants you to know that you don't want anything is because he has given you everything. And well, that's one of the tricks of uh, the seats of the enemy is to always have you focus on what you don't have instead of what the Lord wants you to do to focus on what you do have. A disciple is faithful. And in Matthew 25, 29 it says, For unto everyone that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away, even that which he hath. Like I was saying earlier, if you're the one that's um, doing the discipling, the more that you impart in your disciples from the image of the Lord, the more the Lord will give you to give to your disciples. Amen. And in Luke 16, 10 through 12, it says, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous manner, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is in another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? In other words, while you are being discipled, you want to be faithful in that person that's discipling you. But like I said, you not only do you want to follow that person, but you want to also be in God's word for yourself to know when that person is not following the path of the Lord. In other words, if the word of God tells you to go left and a person is doing the disciple and telling you to go right, you should be able to know for yourself that what the person is leading you the wrong way to say, wait a minute, it says in God's word. And as a discipler and being a disciple, you should always be able to go to the one discipling you if you have a question. Regardless, if, regardless of what the question is, regardless if you think you may hurt that person's feelings, because remember, you're not trying to be in the form and image of that person that's discipling you. You're trying to be uh, put in the form and image of the Lord Jesus. Amen? Okay, one of the things of the Gospels in Acts 11:16 is that in discipling people, we walk them through the phases and experiences of life. We can come al alongside them, and we do not let them go off on their own. Mentoring and small groups will be the keys to success. Discipleship is a lifestyle. As we get into the lives of others, the purpose of loving them is simply because he first loved us, and then we become instruments of his grace. In John 15, the goal of intimacy with Christ, that of being surrendered to biblical priorities and not to our own. Then we become tools that Christ uses to equip others. We are to be equipped so that we can enable others to grow in Christ. Discipleship is not a one-time act. It is a change of heart, a change of direction, and for a lifetime. And in closing, always remember, regardless of what you have done in the past, what you are currently doing, or what you would do in the future as far as sin is, you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So remember that God loves you, and we love you too. And until we meet again, have a blessed day. Amen.